This is FAIR TV. I'm Janine Jackson. If we're to believe reports from NPR's Planet Money, Fox News, and New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof, there's a disturbing increase in the number of Americans receiving Social Security disability benefits. And now, 60 Minutes. When it began back in the 1950s, it was envisioned as a small program to assist people who were unable to work because of illness or injury. Today, it serves nearly 12 million people, up 20% in the last six years, and has a budget of $135 billion. That's more than the government spent last year on the Department of Homeland Security, the Justice Department, and the Labor Department combined. It's been called a secret welfare system with its own disability industrial complex, a system ravaged by waste and fraud. From that intro to the graphic, hands grasping for cash, it wasn't hard to tell where CBS was coming from. The piece was driven by far-right Republican Senator Tom Coburn, perhaps best known for being a climate change denier. The CBS narrative portrays a system easy to cheat, thanks to crooked lawyers and a bureaucracy that can't say no to new applicants. Research, though, says something very different. As the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities explained in a letter to CBS, the Social Security disability standard is incredibly strict, and just four in 10 applicants are awarded benefits. Demonstrating eligibility requires extensive medical evidence, and even people with life-threatening illnesses can wait months, if not years, to receive benefits. Economists note that the increase in claims is not at all surprising. Due to demographic shifts like aging baby boomers, it's been expected since the 1990s. Stories like this one feed into the idea that the poor and disabled don't really need the financial support they're getting, and so the programs that serve them can be cut. Some people think that's miserly. It's also untrue. The Obama White House is said to hate leaks, especially those involving sensitive national security issues. But you can't really say they hate all leaks equally. Over the weekend, a Navy SEAL team raided a compound in Somalia. As this CBS computer recreation shows, the raid targeted a high-level member of the Al-Shabaab terrorist group. U.S. forces apparently retreated after a firefight. But unnamed officials began offering an explanation for the SEAL team's decision, their desire to protect innocent lives. The October 8th Washington Post explained that the SEAL team commander had the authority to call in a U.S. airstrike. Instead, he opted to retreat. Why? The Post's unnamed sources say they were concerned about women and children in the building. CBS Evening News reported the same story. Officials briefed on the operation said the SEAL commander made the right call in deciding to withdraw. The SEALs had not expected to find so many women and children, in effect, human shields, inside the compound. Of course, this anonymous intelligence could be right. But you'd hope journalists would be at least mindful that, in other cases, the rescue of Jessica Lynch in Iraq or the killing of Osama bin Laden, the first version of events anonymously shared with the media, though it almost always portrays the military in a good light, hasn't always turned out to be accurate. And finally, you learn a lot about corporate media when they give you a history lesson. A story in the October 7th issue of Time magazine includes a graphic that is supposed to give readers some grounding in U.S.-Iran relations. Headlined, A History of Hostility and Chances Missed, it starts with the 1979 Iranian Revolution. The Ayatollah Khomeini calls the U.S. the Great Satan, and Americans are taken hostage. A different starting point might be 1953, when the U.S. helped orchestrate a coup in Iran. And other events are missing, like the time in 1988 when the U.S. shot down an Iranian airliner, killing nearly 300 passengers. Or the U.S. support for Iraq during its war with Iran, which included aiding Iraq's chemical weapons attacks. No doubt many Iranians remember this history, and that to the extent that hostility exists between the two countries, this helps explain it. But time leaves those things out, though they do include the time Bill Clinton almost but then didn't talk to the Iranian prime minister in 2000, 
and Barack Obama's YouTube message to the Iranian people in 2009. These events are footnotes at most, and Time's choice of a self-serving distorted picture over accurate history is a funny idea of journalism. I'm Janine Jackson. This is FAIR TV.